I'm in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. We'll get there momentarily. As we're waiting to get there, I read an article in Hard Science Magazine dated June 21st, 2023. I want you to listen to this because the title of the article was that 95% of the universe is a total mystery. And here's basically what the author said. With each passing moment, an unknown, repulsive, persistent force dubbed dark energy is stretching the fabric of the universe. Dark energy, he says, is a fundamental property of space itself. Invisible, smooth, constant, and yet we are entirely unsure what it truly is. And then he says, and then there's the matter of dark matter. So you have dark energy and dark matter, the invisible clumpy matter that binds galaxies together. In many ways, dark matter, he says, is the corollary to dark energy. Where dark energy stretches space apart, dark matter knits matter together. Now, I know some of your, your brain scramble. Just keep going here for a moment. He says they're both invisible. Neither interacts with radiation or light, and yet they are ever-present. Dark matter acting as the cosmic glue for large-scale structure formation and dark energy, a principal ingredient in the universe's evolution. The author says the afterglow of the Big Bang known as the cosmic microwave background, is imprinted on the fabric of space-time, a relic of radiation from which or from when the universe was extraordinarily hot, dense, and smooth. By mapping its bumps and irregularities and comparing with galaxy surveys, scientists have found, this is the important part, that 70% of the universe is made up of dark energy. Meanwhile, 25% of the universe is dark matter. So just 5% of the universe is ordinary matter. Uh, ordinary matter is ev everyday matter in life. Your, your hair, your clothes, your, uh, the atoms, organs, the food you eat, the dogs you kiss, the air, the sea, all the, thing in the human, all the things in the human experience, the sun, the moon, the stars, everything. The basic premise of the article is to try to communicate to us that everything we know, everything we see, is simply 5% of everything in the universe. And here's a quote. In many ways, we are still novices playing with toy models seeking to understand the stars. The remaining 95% of the universe is stuff that we can't see and we don't yet understand. An extraordinarily vast portion of the cosmos is still unknown. Despite the technological advancements of the last century, even with computers at our fingertips, and the worldwide internet and space-based observatories mapping the far reaches of the universe, there is still so much we don't understand. 95% of the entire universe is unknown to us. Now, the reason I, I, I start that way is that when you assume that something can't happen just because you don't completely understand it is ridiculous. The universe happened and it happens, and we don't have a clue. No matter what scientists tell you, we don't have a clue about 95% of the universe and how it's held together. In fact, the universe, we're told, is expanding. But into what is it expanding? Every time I ask that question, I get an answer that I don't understand. And it's not because I'm slow and not because you're slow. There's no extra dimension around the universe and when I ask somebody to explain how it can expand into something that's not there, they act as if they know with certainty, but we don't. When we talk about the virgin birth, oh, now we're moving into Christmas, and other events surrounding the Christmas narrative, the question is not, can it happen? The question is, did it happen? And here's the reason why. With God, all things are possible. You see how the two are connected? There's so much we don't know. 95% of the universe is not in our purview. To act like we know everything is ridiculous. So there are many things that happen every day that we don't have a complete explanation for, yet we know that they're real. They happen. So if you say to me, before I can believe in anything, I have to, I have to understand it completely, then my friend, you're, you can't even believe in the universe. Brian Edwards, a self-proclaimed atheist in New Zealand, always had the same response when he was challenged with the resurrection of Jesus and the virgin birth. He would always respond by saying, it's too fantastical. Well, that's not going to cut it anymore because the universe itself is too fantastical. But it happened. 
And there's no real material explanation for the first cause of the universe. We can tell you what happened after it began, but we cannot tell you who or what kick-started the entire event. And most honest science, scientists today in the field will tell you that the universe should not even be here. And the odds are so fantastical that it could never happen again. Now, all of that's true only if there's no God. You see what I'm saying? The best explanation for the universe is God. If there is a God, the universe is child's play. How hard is it for God to do something like that? Once God is assumed, nothing is impossible. We can say that there are many things that are not likely, like flying pigs, but if God wanted flying pigs, there would be flying pigs. I'm not sure why God wanted porcupines, mosquitoes, and sand gnats, but he did, so we got them. Remember, when you approach the Christmas narrative and approach things like the resurrection and the virgin birth and the Christmas narrative that has so many things we don't understand, you must remember that the universe itself is inconceivable without God. But as soon as God enters the picture, the universe is quite conceivable. The evidence is all around you. As soon as you walk out of a building, it's going to hit you right in the face. So as we approach the Christmas narrative and enter into this series called Inconceivable, I want us to understand that the question is not how can the virgin birth occur? How can God take on the form of a little child, grow into a man, die on a cross, and resurrect from the dead? That's not the question because once you assume God, everything is possible. The real question is, did the virgin birth happen? And the definitive answer is yes. For us Christ followers, the best evidence for the virgin birth is the resurrection. If Jesus rose from the dead, then the virgin birth is no problem. What is inconceivable becomes conceivable and probable when God gets involved. There's so much of the universe we don't understand, but when you when you understand that there is a God who is the first cause of all things, that means that there's so much of the universe we'll never understand because we're not God. But it also means that because God created time and space, he can enter into time and space any time he wants. He's God. Now, the question is, what am I supposed to do with this Christmas narrative that we read every year? What are we supposed to learn from it? Understanding that God exists? Understanding that he stepped into time and space, understanding that the virgin birth is child's play for a God who created all things, what then are we supposed to glean from it? So in order to answer that question, I want us to do something. There is a real movement of revival around our church, and we're going we're gonna to alter a little bit the approach we take to preaching in the years to come, and that is we're going to do more work in the scripture itself. Most of the time, Pastors will prepare, and then they will cut so much because of time to get to the application. And that's important that we apply the truths of God's Word, but I want us to know from the get-go what the Bible says about the original Christmas story. I think there's a lot of assumptions that you hold that are just not true or reflective of the biblical account. So I'm going to read it and stop along the way just to point out a few things. So here is the story recorded in the Word of God about the virgin birth, about God taking on the form of man, coming to this world in the nativity, being raised by Mary and Joseph, dying on a cross for the salvation of the world. This is what the Bible says. This is how the birth of the Messiah, Jesus, came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged. Now, this is the word for betrothal. Uh, in Jesus' time, betrothal or being pledged was just as binding as the covenant of marriage. Uh, in John chapter 14 through 16, Jesus makes a reference to the disciples when he says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not true, I would have told you I'm going back to prepare a place and I will come and collect you. I'll come and get you and take you to be where I am. Well, he borrows a phrase from this idea that when a man betrothed the young girl, they would be engaged he would say to her, I'm going to go back to my father's insula. They lived in insulas where there were extended families. So you didn't have one family, the mother and father, living under one roof or in one village. You had the entire uh, relation, uh, relationship or relational uh, families living all together in what were called insulas. So there were many houses. So the groom would go 
and he would create another space, another house, another room. And when that was completed and he was ready, he would come back and return and take his bride to live with his family. So Mary and Joseph are pledged and it's important. They're betrothed, but they're not yet married. So the Bible tells us before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit, which would have been a serious violation and cost Mary and Joseph much. In verse 19, because Joseph was her husband and was faithful to the law, this is a word, this is the word Sadiq. He was a righteous person, which means he kept the law. He probably had a, a position in the temple, which would have made it even more difficult to find that the woman to whom he's betrothed is pregnant and yet they've not yet come together. And yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He's a man of great character and care and concern. He had in his mind to divor divorce her, but to do it quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David. Now, Matthew writes his gospel to the Jews. So there's some things he says in his narrative specifically aimed at Jewish believers or non-believers trying to help them understand that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of the Messiah. It was important, according to the Old Testament, that Jesus be of the house of David. So Joseph says, or sorry, uh, Matthew writes, that the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus. The actual name is Yeshua. It's time that we point that out. Yeshua is Jesus' real name. Jesus is the Greek and the Latin equivalent. But you and I have other names in other languages, but the, my real name is Jeff, no matter what it sounds like in other languages. Jesus' real name is Yeshua. So Jesus, Yeshua, because he will save his people from their sins. Yeshua means deliverer. Verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew takes that quote directly out of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, that was written hundreds of years before Yeshua was even born to show his Jewish audience Jesus fulfills, Yeshua fulfills the prophecy of the coming Messiah. Verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Yeshua or Jesus. Now, chapter 2 tells us the continuing state of the story. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, here we go again, Bethlehem was the birthplace of King David. So the prophesied familiar connection between Messiah and King David is once again reiterated as Matthew records his, his gospel. During the time of King Herod, King Herod ruled 37 B.C. to 4 B.C. Uh, and so most scholars or historians place the birth of Jesus within that time frame. Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and ask, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. The Magi were not three. The number three is based on the gifts that they brought, but we have no idea how many Magi were traveling. We're told they came from the east. There's a lot of land to the east, so it could be a number of places. Many believe these are Babylonian stargazers because astronomy was advancing at a high rate prior to Jesus' birth. So both the Romans and the Greeks believed that before something happened in the terrestrial, it would first be played out in the heavens, in the stars, in the constellations. So when there's a dramatic human event like the birth of a king that was going to happen, that event, first of all, would be play out with side and symbols, signs and symbols in the constellations. So the Magi, who are most probably Babylonian astrologers, must have noticed movement in the constellation of Aries because Aries in the time of Jesus represent, represented Judea. And of course, if you're going to go to the land of Judea, you're going to go to Jerusalem, to Bethlehem. Or sorry, Bethlehem in Judea. So they came to Jerusalem, making their way to Bethlehem, but they did not come to Herod. Now, most of us think that they immediately went to Herod. They did not. And first, they went through the streets and they asked the residents if they were expecting the birth of a king and where the birth of the king would be. But the Greeks and the Romans and the Babylonians were far more interested in this than the Jews because they were the ones studying the movement in the constellations. 
So it's, so it's not a surprise when they would say, where is this king that is born that people in the streets would not know? But Herod, who's a Hellenistic tyrant, completely aligned with Rome, he would be aware of the movements of the constellations and his magicians would have told him. Herod was brutal. He killed his own family, his own sons, because he was afraid that they would usurp his authority and throne. So the fact that a Jewish king was about to be born on his watch that would threaten his throne, no way was he going to allow that to happen. So we're told in verse 3 of chapter 2 that when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Well, of course he was disturbed and Jerusalem was disturbed as well because if King Herod is disturbed, all of Jerusalem is disturbed because you never know what he's going to do. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, so Herod consults the religious folk, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. And of course, they're going to quote an Old Testament prophecy. They replied, in Bethlehem, in Judea. They replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So Matthew, as he writes, records his gospel, quotes Matthew chapter 5, verse 2. Again, that was written hundreds of years earlier in reference to where the Messiah would be born. Verse 7, then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Now, why does he want to know what time the star appeared? Because when the star appears, it would symbolize the birth of a king. So he wants to know how much time has passed from when the star first appeared till the time that the Magi are searching so that he would know what to do and who to look for. And of course, we learn later, two years, young boys, young baby boys, two years and under are going to be slaughtered under Herod's regime. He hopes that by doing that, he will eliminate the possibility of a coming king. We don't have time to talk about what the star or the aster really was. I've done a previous message in previous years called the Bethlehem Comet. If you have interest in that, please see that version. Please research that online and look at that sermon. I can't do that now. Herod asked, when did the first star appear in order to find out the age of the new king? And then verse 8. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose. Some translations say when it appeared in the east, but it's a, it's a very difficult phrase. But basically the meaning is, when did you first see the star? When did you first start tracking it? And where did it stop when you finally got to the home of the Christ child? Again, there's more research to be done there. Let's move. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child was with his mother Mary. They bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That's why we assume three. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So they... Escaped to Egypt, according to verse 13, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Verse 14, so he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet out of Egypt I called my son. Now, many scholars wonder why it is that Matthew quotes Hosea chapter 1, verse 1, because this is a specific quote, not to the Messiah, but to God's relationship to Israel, as God refers to Israel as his son. But this text refers to God calling the Israelites out of Egypt, not Jesus out of Egypt. So here we see Matthew applying the prophecy given in the Old Testament to Yeshua, why would he do that? He is simply trying to show the connection between Israel, the nation, the children of God, and Yeshua, or Jesus, the child of God. God called all of Israel, the children of God, out of Egypt to continue his work of redemption, and now God is calling his son out of Egypt to complete his work of redemption. So this is why Matthew quotes Hosea 1.1. Because Jesus is not only the fulfillment of the law and prophecy, he is the fulfillment of every type that we find in the Old Testament. In other words, Jesus, Yeshua, is the ultimate Joseph. He delivers his people through pain, suffering, and the betrayal of his own brothers. 
He is the ultimate Abraham. His family is as numerous as the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. He's the ultimate Moses. He leads us to the ultimate promised land. He's the ultimate King David. He will usher in a new kingdom where there'll be no more crying, mourning, or pain. And then in verse 16, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. And here we have another quote out of the Old Testament. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. So why then does Matthew quote, he's writing to the Jews, Jeremiah 3.14? Why does Matthew connect that event with something written, or the birth of Christ, something written so long ago? Now stay with me. It's important. You're learning the Bible here, and I hope you have your Bible open and you're going verse by verse. In Genesis chapter 39, verse 19, it is explained to us that Rachel, passed, you know who Rachel, the wife of Jacob, also the mother of Joseph, that Jacob and Rachel died on the way to Ephrath, which was the original name of Bethlehem. Rachel had a son named Joseph. That name also means deliverer. And Joseph fathered two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who represented the bulk of the 10 northern tribes of Israel. These tribes were scattered and exiled all over the empire in 720 B.C. and again in 590 B.C. So in Jeremiah 3.14, God tells Rachel to stop weeping for her children, all the scattered tribes, because one day they will be redeemed. In Jeremiah 3, verse 16 and 17, we read, this is what the Lord says to Rachel. Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord. They will return from the land of the enemy, so there is hope for your descendants, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own land. So a Jewish reader would have caught hold of what Matthew's doing immediately. Jesus is the deliverer. The time has come. The people will return to the land. A Gentile reader would have been totally lost. However, by including the story of the Magi to the Gentiles who may read this text through the Babylonians, the Romans, the Greeks, who took great interest in the stars and constellations, this story would have had something for them as well. So I hope perhaps that's the first time you've read the Christmas story like that. That is the story. But now the question is, what, what does that mean for us? Now listen. I am very excited that we've been able to do the textual work, but I want you to hear me now because I wonder, why would God record this for you and me to read thousands of years later? What am I supposed to get out of all of this? And then I start to think, how many times did Mary review the angel's words as she felt the Son of God kicking against the walls of her uterus? How many times did Joseph second guess his encounter with the angel as he endured the hot shame of living among villagers who could plainly see the changing shape of his fiance, Were they ever tempted to say, God, you gave us this wonderful promise. Do I have to be humiliated while I wait for its fulfillment? As I go through this narrative and consider what the Holy Spirit wants the modern day people of God, the, the people whom God loves, what is our life-changing lesson? I think there are two things here quickly. Number one, it reminds us that we, you and I, are the underdogs. It's time that Christians in the West acknowledge this. We are not the home team. Things will not be easy for us. The odds will always be stacked against us. And it's true we're part of God's kingdom, but the world will struggle with that. Imagine how difficult it would have been for Mary and Joseph's friends to believe them. In fact, they would have probably assumed they were, they'd lost their minds. Really? God is the Father? For one thing, is this really the way God would choose to enter our world? I've mentioned almost every holiday that I was coming back from Jacksonville, Florida, on my way back to Savannah, where I was a teaching pastor in my 30s. And I had not been listening to the radio, and it was, the, it was late at night. I was driving late to try to get home for the next morning. And this huge fireball shoots across the sky. 
And now it terrified me in the beginning, but then I turned on the radio and realized they had just launched the space shuttle. And that was this fireball shooting across the sky. But for some reason, as I'm, in a, I'm, a, I'm alone in my car and I see this fireball, the thought dawns on me, why didn't Jesus come to earth like this? Our God came to earth not as a raging whirlwind, nor a devouring fire. And I think what is less threatening than a newborn baby with its arms folded next to its body in a blanket? Would, would God really come to earth like this, as the underdog? I mentioned a few years ago when the Queen of England used to visit a foreign land, every time she visited, it cost somewhere around $20 million. I mean, there's a lot of hoopla. Pomp and circumstance, 4,000 pounds of luggage, outfits for every possible contingency, even a funeral, 40 pints of plasma, leather toilet seat covers, a host of servers and attendants. But God, the God who could order army and empires, the God who could order armies and empires like pawns on a chessboard, that God emerges in Palestine as a baby who depended on a teenager for shelter, food, and love. Yes, we too are called to a life of humility. Our lives are not to be based on the number of people who follow us, but upon the number of people we compel to follow Jesus. But there's another side of that humble coin, and it's the side of the underdog. Christ's followers, as did Mary and Joseph, willingly placed themselves in a position of the underdog. America loves the underdog, right? Right? Typically, we do. I did a little research. The five greatest underdog movies of all time. What do you think they are? Okay. Number one, The Karate Kid. Okay. Number two, Rocky. Of course, my question is, which one? <laughs> Rocky one through six. And I think they're still making them on their call something else now. And then number three was a movie called Rudy about a young man who wants to play football at Notre Dame, but he's only five foot, six inches tall and 160 uh, uh, pounds. Four, Shawshank Redemption. Most men will know what that story is about. And then five, I never watched this, but evidently it was popular, called The Revenge of the Nerds, something that I'd rather not see. But the kind of underdogs Christ calls us to be, listen now, is the type that always appear to be losing when in fact they're winning. That is, the, I believe with all my heart and soul, the application of the original narrative of the Christmas story is to remind us that even though God is doing a fantastic work, we're always the underdogs. And when it appears that we are losing, we are always, in fact, winning. You remember the old man Simeon? We find his story in Luke chapter 2 as well. He had been promised by the Holy Spirit that he would not, he would not die until he held the consolation of Israel in his arms. Do you notice what happened in verse 29 of Luke 2? Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, you, you know, if Simeon would have stopped right there, it would have been a fantastic event. Instead, he says, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. And the reality is, as we just read in the story, it didn't take very long, did it? The political leaders tried to kill the infant Jesus immediately as Herod slaughtered every baby boy two years and under because he was afraid that Jesus might usurp his power and authority. I am pleading with the church, especially in the West, to understand something before it's too late. We are no longer the home team, and the odds are heavily stacked against us, and it will often appear that we are losing. When you see the political and economic climate in this country disintegrating into imbecility, you'll begin to doubt that you're on the winning team, that God's kingdom is truly going to win out in the end. Those doubts will cross your mind that God's upper hand will often seem inconceivable. There was a recent headline that I took special note of. It said, Finnish parliamentarian found not guilty of a hate speech for a Bible tweet. So I read the story. Evidently, the former Finnish, uh, Finnish minister of the interior shared her faith-based beliefs on Twitter 
And as a result, she faced three significant criminal charges. So I read down into the story to try to understand what was, going to ha what was happening here. And evidently, she shared her Christian beliefs on marriage and sexual ethics in a 2019 tweet. As a result, listen to this, she was charged with war crimes, crimes against humanity. And I read the tweet, and it wasn't hate-filled or a ranting post. She simply stated what Christians have believed for over 2,000 years, that marriage is between a man and a woman, and that sex is between a man and a woman in the context of marriage. So Paivi Rasanen was eventually acquitted after four years of trial and great expense to her. She was acquitted, but the cost was great. Now listen, I know when we go into these areas, sometimes it's very difficult to grapple with them, but it's important that we do because we are the underdog. And why are we the underdog? And why should we be prepared and ready to face the coming persecution? You've heard me say that Hitler did very little reading but he did read Karl Marx and Nietzsche. And it was Nietzsche who believed that religion had weakened human dignity and power by foisting upon people the notions of guilt and repentance. He says guilt and repentance are truly, utterly dehumanizing and inhibiting to societal progress and human power. So there's this famous Hitler quote that goes like this, I want to raise a generation of young people devoid of a conscience, imperious, relentless, and cruel. So there are many who believe that Hitler wanted to eradicate the Jews for something far more sinister than economic reasons or even a bloodline. He wanted to eliminate the people through whom the moral law had come, the Jews. Hitler equated morality with the Jews and guilt with weakness. And in his atheistic framework, catalyzed the belief that the bloodline of Germany was superior and the only thing stopping Germany from eradicating the weaker races was a moral law that produced guilt which stifled forward progress. In other words, in Hitler's mind, remove the Jews, remove the moral law. Remove the moral law, remove guilt. Remove guilt, remove the barriers to cruelty. Remove the barriers to cruelty, take over the world. Now apply that thought with the world in which you and I live today, where a few years ago a Jewish journalist in Washington, writing for the Washington Post, said this, and I quote, Christians will be the Jews of the 21st century. Why? When the West wants to live without restraint, it targets morality. And when it targets morality, it targets the Christian. We are the ones, they say, stifling forward progress. We are the ones who keep talking about an alternative kingdom. We're the ones who speak of right and wrong as if they're objective. And we hold the Word of God dear and believe that we're all accountable to it. And quite frankly, that inspires hate. But it's an old story, isn't it? Cain's final solution was to silence the voice of the one whose life reflected sanctity. Joseph's brother's final solution was to do away with the one who represented the special favor of God. Herod decapitated John the Baptist for essentially calling him out concerning his unfaithfulness. And Jezebel pursued Elijah for exposing the weakness and falsehood of her gods. And then, of course, there's the story of Jesus in John chapter 11 when he raises Lazarus from the dead, and instead of the religious leaders worshiping him and following him, they plotted as how they could kill him because they're losing their power and control of the masses. Listen, I don't know of a time, perhaps other than the first century, that this is more applicable. As long as Christians exist, the powers that be will not be able to control the masses, and they know it. For we serve no God but God. We bow to no master other than Jesus Christ. We hold no morality other than the word of God. We have no rights other than that have been given to us by God. And yes, we will be good citizens. But when the laws of our government begin to violate the law of God, we will not conform. And consequently, we're going to be persecuted. As a result, it will often appear that we are losing it will appear that we're heavily outnumbered. It will appear that we'll be defeated. It will appear that the odds are heavily stacked against us. But the words of the prophet Elisha 
to his servants still ring true. Those who are for us outnumber those who are against us. And Elijah prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Make no mistake, we may appear to be the underdog, when in reality, the heavens are on our side. And at the right moment and the right time, when God has completed his purpose in all this rebellion, the underdog wins. Jeremiah Denton, who was a Vietnam POW, wrote a book called When Hell Was in Session. And from his imprisonment and torture, he began to wonder how God was involved. And then his mind shifted to the reality of Mary at the foot of Jesus' cross. And he puts words into her mouth as he writes this. Referring to Mary, her face shows grief, but not despair. Her head, though bowed, has faith to spare. For even now, she could suppose his thorns might somehow yield a rose. Her life with him was full of signs that God writes straight with crooked lines. Dark clouds can hide the rising sun and all seem lost when all is one. It may look like that we're losing, but when all seems lost, all is one. Do you know why? Now stay with me. Because God's kingdom is always growing underneath in the midst of all the turmoil. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour, until it worked all through the dough. Notice, Jesus uses the metaphor of seed and yeast. Seed grows into a large tree, but it's so small, and yeast slowly rises within the, within the, within the, uh, within the, the bread. Both are slow, but they ultimately win in the end. You know, I grew up in a very small town called Elizabeth in Tennessee, and we would often ride our bikes on the sidewalks, and the sidewalks were not well-maintained, and I noticed that grass was always growing. So you weren't sure if you're on the sidewalk or the grass. Grass everywhere. You know why? Because in a game where seed versus concrete, seed wins every time. And the reason is, is because seed is organic. It's organic life. It's alive. Concrete is dead. The Word of God is alive and active. The kingdom of God is unshakable. It's living. It may be slow. It may be often unnoticeable, but one day it's always going to break through. After the six trumpets of Revelation, where the writer tells us there's going to be calamity on the earth, on the land and sea, and the streams of natural water, springs, people, sun, moon, and stars, and then he says, referring to the end, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet. And there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and our Messiah or his Messiah and he will reign forever and ever. Mary might look like the underdog, but she's carrying the victory of all mankind inside of her. Joseph may have looked like he had lost everything, but in reality he had won everything. And all of God's people may have begun to wonder if God has abandoned them. But when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, it had been 400 years since he had spoken. And yet, in one moment of time, when they looked like the underdog, when they looked like they were going to lose, everything changed. So first, quickly, we're the underdogs. We need to get that through our heads. We're not the home team. The odds will be against us. But in reality, even when it looks so bleak, the kingdom of God is rising up on the inside of every human heart that has called on the name of Jesus and it's rising through culture and one day it's going to break through and what we know to be a reality becomes a present reality. Now here's the second and final thing. Not only are we underdogs, but we're underdogs who never give up because God always wins. Hey, you know, going back to that movie, Rudy, if you know the full story, he dreams there's a small kid, five foot six, 160 pounds, but his dream is to play football for the University of Notre Dame. And in those days, Notre Dame was the football university. The only problem is he's small. He doesn't have any money to get in. 
Uh, he, he doesn't qualify for a scholarship because of his grades. He also has dy- dyslexia, so that's a problem he's going to have to face if he gets accepted into the university. Everything's against him. Actually, as I studied his story, it reminds me of me. I always say to people, you know what? If I could run, jump, shoot, or play defense, I could have been in the NBA. <laughs> Other than that, it would have all been good. Rudy has everything against him. A friend ends up tutoring him to help him with his dyslexia. He gets into Notre Dame, which is amazing, a miracle in and of itself. He is relentless in his pursuit. He goes to the football team, begs to be a member of the practice squad. So when you're a practice squad, you just get beat up all week during practice, but you don't dress with the team. You don't sit on the sidelines during the game. You don't ever get to wear the uniform. But Rudy did it anyway. He was determined, and he believed one day he is going to play football for Notre Dame. And then it came to his final game of his final year, And some of the other seniors on the team convinced the coach that Rudy should be on the playing squad. He got into the uniform. He actually got into the game, which is inconceivable. Five foot, six foot, or five foot, six inch tall, 160 pound pass rusher playing for Notre Dame. Inconceivable. But Rudy, Rudiger, absolutely convinced that one day he would play football for the University of Notre Dame, played football got into the game for three plays and actually sacked the quarterback. And at the end of the game, he was carried off the field by his team as if he had just won a championship fight. Rudy was right. One day, he did play for Notre Dame. Can I say something to all of you listening, please? When God promises something to you, he always delivers. Even when it appears he's not going to, even when it seems that things are not lining up, the way that would deliver that objective. Simeon must have thought to himself, and I'm sure Mary and Joseph too, God promised me I would see his salvation, but my goodness, I'm an old man. I don't have very long. God promised us we would deliver the Christ child, but we got to make this long journey to Bethlehem and we'll probably lose our lives on this dangerous road on the way. When Herod began killing all the baby boys under two years, Mary and Joseph are running to Egypt for their lives. I'm sure they asked the question, did we hear God correctly? Do God's promises actually come true? Why does it often appear that as though God has lost his hold on things and that his promises will not come true? And I want to tell you, the Christmas narrative is included so that you and I would understand something. It can be hundreds of years before God speaks, but make no mistake, he will have the last word. Some of you mothers, you can't explain it, but God spoke to your heart and told you that your children will come back to the Lord. When you try to explain that to somebody, they don't understand. They tell you that you're, you're, you're hearing a voice that's not real. But you know, in the depths of your soul, God has given you that promise. You can't explain it. You can't iterate it. But you know it's true. Can I tell you something? Do not give up. Do not give in. Trust. Wait. No matter how bad it looks, he may be in prison. She may be in a horrible relationship. They may be making horrible, destructive decisions. But you've heard from God. You pray, you wait, because what God promises cannot be undone. Besides, the thing about waiting is that God knows what has to happen before the thing he's promised becomes a reality. You're waiting on God to complete his good work. And waiting patiently means that you trust God to accomplish all that he needs to accomplish in the waiting period. That's what trusting God means. Trusting his promises means that the door to ultimate fulfillment of those promises often does not fling open suddenly, but it's nudged open little by little until all of a sudden there's a choir singing to a bunch of shepherds in an open field. I just came through a very difficult season in my own life. And I'd been praying for a long time, and I told my wife, God gave me this word. I know this is what he's going to do in our church. I know revival is coming. He's told us to pray for revival. He's told me it's coming. But look, Robin, look around. It doesn't look like things are lining up for revival to come. In fact, it looks like it's going the opposite direction. And I love, because if I complain to Robin, I'm usually going to get a good quote. And I complain, and she goes, let me get this straight. You ask God to do something big, and then you complain about his methods? And she said, I heard a pastor once say, suck it up. Wait on God. God always comes through. I hate it when my wife quotes me to me. I said those words. 
Some of you are certain that God has told you that he will provide a job for you, but it looks bad. No one's returning your calls. You're running out of money. It's crunch time. You're afraid. Don't give up. Don't give in. Trust. Wait. No matter how bad it looks, let God be God. He will deliver. He always does. He always has. Silent for 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. Boom! Suddenly the angels are singing to the shepherds. The magi are bringing gifts. Kings are shaking in their shoes and all of heaven is rejoicing. Whatever it is, wait, trust. It may seem like a long time. Things may be headed in the opposite direction. The Christmas narrative reminds you, yes, we're underdogs, but we're underdogs who always win. And that's why we sing this song called Firm Foundation. I love it. He's never let me down. He's faithful in every season. So why would he fail now? There's a little pause. He won't. He won't fail. And what is true about this world is true about your life. Underneath the surface, the kingdom of God is growing and will one day break through as the kingdom of this world becomes the kingdom of our Christ and children return to their parents and diseases are healed and mourning will be turned to dancing. Sorrow will be turned to joy for the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of God of our Christ. That is the application into our lives as Christ followers. We're the underdogs. Yeah. And it looks bleak, but we're the underdogs who win. Father, thank you for the powerful truth and the narrative of the Christmas story. I pray your blessings on this message as it goes out. And I pray that we would be a people who return to the word of God and suddenly we take interest in reading what the Bible says rather than reading books about the Bible. So help us as we go forward to increase our knowledge of the scriptures and then successfully apply it into our everyday lives. Yeah, we are underdogs. It looks bleak sometimes, but we're the underdogs who always win. In Christ's name, amen.